Welcome to this uh, New America online event, Iraq, 20 years after the US invasion, which uh, will be March 19th, March 20th. Uh, we have a distinguished group of panelists to discuss kind of what the legacies and futures of Iraq and the war are. Uh, we're joined from Baghdad by Simona Fulton, who's a uh, work for Al Jazeera. She's been based in Baghdad for since 2018. Uh, she's also a, a special correspondent for the PBS News Hour. There, uh, we're also joined by Ab, uh, Razak Al Saidi, uh, who has uh, worked for the New York Times in Iraq and uh, is now based in Boston. He works for Physicians for Human Rights, uh, and also by Colonel Joel Rayburn, who is a fellow at New America and also uh, has written uh, two books, one massive 500,000 word book about the Iraq war and the US Army's role in the, the Iraq war. Uh, and also uh, a, a shorter but very important book called Iraq After America, which came out uh, in the shortly after the United States withdrew and made, I think, a lot of accurate predictions about what that future would look like. Uh, he was also the senior director for Iraq on the National Security Council. So we're going to begin with Simona uh, to tell us kind of what's going on on the ground right now and what she sees the future uh, uh, look like. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for having me, Peter. I'm very grateful uh, to New America for hosting this event, uh, particularly in light of uh, many other news, uh, Ukraine, the recent earthquakes, um, it certainly feels like um, a lot of attention and resources have recently been diverted away uh, from Iraq and having base, been based here almost five years, uh, it feels like the international attention is shifting away. We're seeing, uh, you know, some news organizations, American news organizations, either downsizing or closing their bureaus. And that's uh, certainly very worrying because Iraq is an important country for the region's stability. and. And of course, uh, the US uh, has an enduring responsibility towards this country. Uh, for the American public, it may feel like the Iraq invasion is a thing of the past, but um, Iraqis, they continue to bear the consequences uh, of the invasion until now and every single day. And I'll, and I'll get into what some of those consequences are, but I just wanted to quickly you know, recap how, how we got here looking back. So when when the US invaded Iraq 20 years ago, um, it, it removed uh, a largely stable and secular, although repressive uh, regime uh, that had kept a lid on Iranian influence as well as extremist groups like Al Qaeda, for example. Then the CPA, the, the Coalition Provisional Authority, went on to dismantle Iraq's institutions, including the Iraqi army, um, essentially creating a power vacuum that was quickly filled by Islamist parties and, and radical armed groups, which began vying for power. And you can see that happening until today. And I will get back to that later uh, to speak a little bit about what happened in the green zone uh, last August. What followed, of course, we know the sectarian wars, which ended up killing hundreds of, of thousands of people. And I think what is also important to mention, which what still has an influence until today, is that when Saddam fell, um, he was essentially to some extent a bulwark to go to outside influence. And since then, Iraq has really kind of become uh, a playground for regional and global powers to pursue their own interests. Um, in a way, it has become a, a battleground of sorts where you have not just the US and, and Iran, but the Gulf, increasingly Turkey, uh, essentially meddling in, in Iraq's uh, internal affairs, propping up certain politicians over others to pursue their own interests. And that has really contributed to uh, an ongoing fragmentation of the country and has really undermined Iraq's sovereignty. So in a way, I mean, you could say now, 20 years on, you know, Iraq is relatively stable, but have Iraqis really tasted the dividends of democracy? And I think a lot of people will say that the answer is no, because um, fundamentally the, the system of governance that was put in place by the US, uh, which was intended to uh, create a balance of power between the different ethno-sectarian groups, what it ended up doing is that it really installed a system that uh, fueled corruption. And what you have today is essentially a kleptocracy where parties, different political parties across the spectrum, including Kurds, Sunnis, Shia, they see government positions really only as a means to line their pockets and fuel their patronage networks. And so this has completely hollowed out the Iraqi state. 
uh, the bureaucracy that was once functioning is completely paralyzed and unable to deliver the most basic services to the population. And as a result of that, you can really see there is a continuity from, you know, when you know, Iraq had its golden days in the 60s, and then things kind of began getting worse with the Iran-Iraq war and sanctions. And this negative trend has continued with education levels plummeting, health plummeting, uh, gender rights regressing because you have these tribal traditions that got stronger. So you have all of these young Iraqis who have kind of come of age in the last two decades who don't really know Saddam, but who are yearning for some kind of strongman rule that will reinstate order, that will protect Iraq's sovereignty. And we saw that during the Tishrin protests, right? Um, I would speak to a lot of the protesters in the protest squares and they would demand the return of a presidential system. They would uh, you know, demand uh, even some uh, military coup. Actually, they were, you know, for example, calling for, uh, for Abdel Wahab Asadi to, to do a coup to get rid of this entire elite and you know, install some kind of military rule. And that is shocking to hear from, you know, from Iraqis who, of course, you know, to a large extent, I think everybody agrees that Saddam was, was, was good riddance overall. But it just highlights the loss of legitimacy of the current, uh, of the current uh, system. And so you, you, you could argue that, okay, let's not be so pessimistic because it's only been 20 years and 20 years is not a long time to really build a democracy. So we really need still more time to build institutions to really uh, you know, support this democratic process. And after all, we have had five elections that were more or less free and fair. We've had uh, you know, a peaceful transfer of power more or less from one uh, government to the next, but we do still have political violence as we saw last year uh, with the fighting in the green zone when you essentially had Muqtada al-Sadr invading the green zone in what many believed was an attempt to take power by force after he failed uh, to form a government through constitutional means. And then you ended up having fighting between Sarai al-Salam and the, the PMF, the Popular Mobilization Forces. And that really highlighted the pitfalls of the system where you have, where each political actor has an armed wing. And that is not something that is uh, really reserved for these Iran aligned actors, as we often kind of like to say, um, it's, it's something that you see across the spectrum. You have the Kurdish parties who have their Peshmerga, you have Muqtada who has Saray Salam, you have Nuri al-Maliki who commands certain parts of the security forces, even though they're on government payroll. So it's unfortunate that it's really the militarization of politics, just like corruption is very much the norm. And it's something that happens uh, across the spectrum. So, um, so those are kind of the new problem, the old problems that we're all very familiar with, right? When we talk about Iraq, the problem is that now on top of that, you have new problems and the government has not really been able to even come up with a strategy on, on how to face them. And I will just touch on two of those problems. So the first one is the drug trade. And this is a very serious issue that is affecting Iraq and also neighboring countries. Um, drug use has really become rampant among Iraqi youth. Um, there's a lot of unemployment, a lot of disillusionment, and people are increasingly seeking escape uh, in cheap crystal meth, which is mostly coming in through the border from Iran, also from Afghanistan. Um, but there's also some signs that is, there is also production taking place locally. And then there is also, from the other side, Captagon coming in uh, from, uh, from Syria. And you know, this is really a, a huge challenge for uh, for the for the Iraqi uh, for the Iraqi government, and I think it is you know it is really very difficult to to deal with it. And we have seen that the state is ill-equipped to deal with it. There are not enough rehab centers. Uh, drug users are thrown into prison in thousands, where they graduate to drug dealers. Um, we have. Uh, we have to think of this as not again. There is a tendency to kind of look at this as a consequence of. Iran's influence and the way some, especially Western analysts and officials think about a drug trade, okay, this is like the, the, the Iranian backed armed groups are using this to finance their operations. And again, that's a very, I think, limited perspective because it ignores that essentially, um, you know, it has become deeply embedded in the Iraqi state itself. You have police who take bribes so that they register smaller quantities of contraband. You have judges taking bribes so that they give lower sentences. It's really something like a government official described this to me as a, as, a, as a state mafia, so to say, that is enabling this drug trade. Um, and the worst part of it is it has really infected the security forces. Um, you have a lot of drug use uh, within the security forces who are supposed to combat it. And, and just as an example, one 
uh, one officer re recently told me that they used to have this policy of, of dismissing any soldier who was using drugs. And he told me that he cannot do that anymore because he would lose half of his battalion. So that's just to highlight how, how widespread it is. Um, the second challenge that Iraq is facing is climate change. Um, Iraq is warming up twice as fast as the global average and its rivers are uh, slowly but certainly drying up, uh, both to, due to climate change, but also because of the dams that have been built further upstream in, in Turkey uh, as well as Iran. And the consequences have already been devastating. Last summer was really bad for farmers. You had a lot of farmers having to abandon their lands uh, and move to urban centers, which are already uh, incapable of providing services for the urban population. Uh, and this is something that will continue. 18% of Iraqis are employed in the agricultural sector. So imagine if that is no longer sustainable, you'll have these waves of displacement uh, going towards the cities. And this is uh, simply a recipe for unrest, intracommunal conflict, and it's, it's a source of future instability. So those are kind of the new challenges that Iraq is facing. And I know I painted a really bleak picture now. Um, so I want, to, <laughs> I want to maybe end on a positive note um, that I mean, overall there is, still, there is still sign of progress. I mean, you, you drive through Baghdad today in the evenings and you'll see lots of restaurants open, families out and about enjoying their evenings. And that was not possible just a few years ago. So, so there is reason you know, for hope that at least the security situation overall is more stable. If you compare Iraq to other countries in the region relatively, like if you, you know, look east and west, there is freedom of speech. There are relatively free media, although they're very politicized. Um, and there are certainly, uh, certainly issues with that as well. But uh, but, you know, again, it's, it's, it's relative. Iraq has a very young population. There's tons of potential for, for growth and investment. So I think what the country really needs is a functional government, uh, a government that actually represents the interests of its people and not uh, its elites. And that is something that, you know, we haven't seen until now. Um, so I think, you know, that is really, you know, as I see it, like there, there is there is still potential for Iraq to succeed, but it, it needs good leadership. And most of all, it needs to put an end to corruption, which is, I think, what it really comes down to. If, if corruption can be curbed, then the government will be able to deliver, you know, investments in infrastructure, services to its population. Um, and, and, you know, it will create a certain foundation to, to get onto a positive tra trajectory again. Thank you, Simona, for that uh, very <clears throat> succinct, if slightly depressing summary. And um, Abdul Razak. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for having me. So let me start sharing uh, one memory. The sound of sirens woke me up after midnight on March 20, 2003. Shortly afterward, the telephone rang. It was a friend of mine saying, congratulations. The United States military was waging a war against Saddam Hussein. My friend is Sunni, Adam Shia. The background of his family is Ba'athist, opposite to mine. Like most Iraqis, we had impatiently waited for the war that would remove Saddam from power. Mark the end of that era and allow us to begin to plan for the future. In the coming years, my friend house was raided many times by the US soldier. Later, he and his family become refugees in Syria, where they still live today. My family had fared better. I think about this story of such fates as we come together today to talk about the legacy of the, of the Iraq war, what we Iraqis hoped for and what we actually got. On March 19th or 20th in Iraq time, 2003 was the end of an era that the start of a new. It was also the latest in a series of destructive events. Iraq experienced about seven revolutions and coup in the last century. The latest one in 2003 change our life drastically. A few major things went right, but unfortunately more went wrong. 
We were freed from a vicious dictator. For the first time, we enjoyed many freedoms. Freedom of speech, free and open media, freedom to protest. We had been liberated by the United States military. However, while the end of Saddam's regime was the end of one fear, it was the beginning of a new fear. We thought by the end of Saddam, the violence and the atrocity would be over. Unfortunately, instead, we saw a different and a new wave of conflict and atrocity, mainly committed by non-state sectors. The invasions empowered the Shia majority as the primary political leader. For the first time in the history, from 1921, when the modern Iraq state was established and until, until the, um, the fall of Saddam regime, Iraq had been politically and socially aligned with the, Sunni, with, the, uh, with, the, with the Arab Sunni world. The invasion of 2003, in fact, revived the deep divisions between Sunni and Shia, not just among politicians as before, but it's got deeper among the society. It also revived the Shia Iran political and military influence across the Middle East and reshaping the nature of the conflicts in Middle East and, and the Arab world. And inside Iraq, power sharing among ethnic religious entities, which is articulated by sectarian political quotas, in Arabic we call muhasasa, had become a recipe for failure and foster a continued lack of accountability. With the liberation from Saddam, we might have gained our freedom, but we lost our national identity. Of course, we have continued to meddle along. Economically, Iraq saw major improvement. When section ended, the average of Iraqi income increased dramatically as did oil revenue. One of the CPA major achievement was the reconstitution and launch the Iraqi currency to stabilize Iraqi economy. However, in the intervening year, bad governance, misuse and corruption has left Iraq economic and, fi and financial sector brittle, unstable and unsustainable. Since the US changed the ruling system from dictatorship to democracy, Iraq has several free elections, which is might consider the best in the region. But is Iraq a democratic state? Democracy is more than holding elections. It must be sustained by building institutions and empowering the rule of law. But we see the main concern of Iraqi political leader are enjoying power and its benefits and compensate themselves for decades of oppression and neglect. There was no vision on how to rebuild the country or to help society recover or how to deal with the legacy of atrocity of Saddam or learn the basic of good governance. I've been asked many, many, many times this question, would Iraq have been better off without the invasion? hundreds of thousands of lives lost and trillion of dollars wasted. Moreover, the invasion paved the way to empower Iran as the main threat in the Middle East, that's according to the US. But before the answer, how about this? How about if Iraqis could have ousted Saddam without foreign help? Would that have avoided us a bloody civil war? Was what happened inevitable? I think Iraq, Iraqis should not only blame the US. It is a complicated country and there is no easy answer. However, I think Iraqis deserve better than Saddam and the poorly planned invasion. Thank you. Thank you. Colonel Rayburn. Okay, good day. Listen, I wanna start by saying, uh, you know, no one asked Captain Rayburn's opinion on uh, whether the United States should invade Iraq in the uh, early 2003. So I don't, 
I don't uh, accept any ownership of that decision. Um, and however, and, and, and I'll say that if decision makers were confronted with the same problem of 2003 today, but knowing what the intervening 20 years has been like, no, no U.S. decision maker in their right mind, I think, would rerun uh, the 2003 invasion, certainly the way it was run and the aftermath. Having said that, uh, I would never wish Saddam and Uday and Qusay back on the Iraqis. I think we have to put things in a little bit of perspective. What would the Middle East have been like for the last 20 years with the Saddam regime still in place? It probably would have been pretty horrific. Remember, Saddam killed more Iraqis in a 60-day period in 1991 than the entirety of Iraqis that were killed, the entire number of Iraqis that were killed during the Civil War period of 2003 to 2011. So the Saddam nostalgia is, is pretty misguided. Uh, let me, uh, rather than uh, touch on the bleak state of affairs in Iraq today, and I agree with uh, Simona and Abdul Razak on, on, on a lot of those. Uh, let, me, let me start first by examining uh, the, what the invasion and its aftermath 20 years on signifies for the US, for US decision making. So I, I think if for the US to take proper stock of, uh, of the Iraq war, of the US relationship with Iraq, I think you have to, you have to start by saying that the state of affairs that exists today or existed in 2011 didn't flow uninterruptedly as a consequence of the invasion of 2003. Um, it's a, it, there, there's been for 20 years a shortcut of saying, well, George W. Bush caught, well, you know, the situation in Baghdad is such George W. Bush uh, created this by his decision to invade in March, April, 2003, et cetera, et cetera. But, that that's uh, there were many intervening decision points, uh, both in the U.S. and uh, and elsewhere, including among the Iraqi political class. And if you just gloss over those, skip over those, sweep them under the rug, and there are some political factions that want to sweep them under the rug, then uh, and leave the leave those decisions and the courses of events uh, that that followed them unexamined. Then you're really not learning anything. I think I, I think you you don't then address um, you you don't address the the problems that that led to the invasion of 2003. From a U.S. perspective, the decisions of 2003, and I've examined this in detail along with my team for years. Those decisions of 2003, and even the decisions of 2003 to 2006 on the U.S. side, those weren't made by stupid people. Those, were, those decisions were made by highly intelligent, highly experienced people, and they were made um, mostly in, in a sense of consensus that the very wise, very experienced, very sharp people, intelligent people sitting around a table all agreed on taking what appeared to them at the time to be the best course of action. That was true not just of 2003, but of 2009 to 11 and after. The decisions of 2009 to 2011, which resulted in, which culminated in the US withdrawal from Iraq at the end of 2011, look pretty stupid today. Just as the decision, if you don't, if you don't examine the context and so on, the decision to invade looks pretty stupid today. But as I say, in both cases, those decisions were made by intelligent, experienced people who were almost uh, uh, in unanimous consensus uh, about taking that course of action. So the bigger takeaway for me, and so, so it, it's insufficient to say, well, those decisions were made by dumb people. We're not dumb people, so we're not at risk of making those kinds of dumb decisions. The, the bigger takeaway, which should be more scary, is that highly intelligent people made what seemed like the best decisions to them at the time and almost brought us to the US to strategic defeat on multiple occasions. So I think you, you have to be humble about assessments. You also have to be, there's something, and, and, and that's, um, that's the greater takeaway about the nature of strategic decision-making I, I think has to be taken into account. We also have to be careful 
in strategic decision making about what we think we know, uh, not just on the question of weapons of mass destruction, which I think has been examined to death, I think over-examined. Iraq was a black box to the United States in 2003. The United States, I remember I, there was an assumption, for example, that there were no internal politics in Iraq, there were no internal factions in Iraq that were meaningful, and that and, and there was a conflation of the Saddam regime with the Iraqi state. Uh, and similarly, the assumptions that underpinned the decisions of 2009 to 2011 were, were uh, spectacularly wrong, especially in retrospect. So I think the bigger takeaway is that, you know, why should decision makers have assumed that their courses of action would be easy or should have um, minimized, underestimated the potential consequences of their courses of action? Now, moving back to 2003, uh, the decision to uh, decision to do a regime change quickly unraveled into state collapse. I think this is, for me, the 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 strategic consequences of of the of the invasion. I think that's the biggest one for the period of two thousand three uh, to two thousand eight. So much of what the United States and the rest of the coalition members and the Iraqis themselves were dealing with after 2003 were the consequences and, and really, I think, predictable consequences of state collapse as opposed to regime change. But so there was, there was not a careful, in the, the execution, in other words, of regime change was not carefully done and, and, uh, and the consequences were underestimated. The biggest thing, and I, I would, I would uh, and Simona has made this point already, is that institutions matter. Uh, so, you have to be careful about conflating regimes with state institutions, and and I think one thing that uh, Iraq has has uh, ha has reminded us is you, you may hate the state institutions, but you'll hate the world without them even more, most likely. Uh, the uh, I think, for example, you know, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini didn't make that same mistake in the regime change in in Iran in 1979. The, the early Islamic Republic um, preserved state institutions and then purged them at their leisure uh, afterwards, but the, that, that, was, uh, that was not done in Iraq. Uh, also from the US perspective, what began as a 9-11 driven war, and remember the, the rationale for removing Saddam was based on uh, the, the, broader, uh, uh, the, the broader context of 9-11. But that 9-11 driven war quickly became a war against the Iranian regime and its axis of resistance. But the strategic approach in Washington never changed. It remained a 9-11 and counterterrorism uh, driven war. It didn't take account uh, uh, of, of the change in the, in the character of the war to one that, that was being waged more against the Iranian regime and the Syrian regime than anybody else. And, that brings me to another lesson that throughout, from 2003 down to today, there's never been a coherent U.S. strategy to account for the role of, or, or the actions, the policies that Tehran and the Assad regime were implementing in Iraq. Never has Washington had uh, a, a coherent approach to these problems. And it's been left to tactical commanders or, or diplomats to try to work out and mitigate the problems of, of uh, an Iranian invasion, military invasion, basically, of Iraq and a, and a Syrian uh, re regime intervention in Iraq. And the problem has always been beyond the means of tactical commanders and operational diplomats to handle. The reason that this is, uh, the, the reason um, that U.S. False policy has failed along these lines is because a military campaign that's detached from a political strategy is useless. I mean, that's the message of Clausewitz, I think, uh, Bismarck and so on. People and communities and factions and forces fight for political objectives, for political reasons. And unless you resolve the underlying political conflict or conflicts that is driving the military conflict, then you can never win or resolve the military conflict. And there have only been brief times, brief windows in Iraq and elsewhere where the US military strategy was in alignment with a political strategy. Most often there's simply an absence of a political strategy, more, uh, but there were also times at which the military strategy and the political strategy were explicitly at odds. 
the US has never, nor, nor the rest of the international community, has never accounted for what the Iranian regime is trying to accomplish in Iraq and has gone a long way toward accomplishing. Qasem Soleimani, who's you know, thankfully dead now, but he, he, was the, he was the one who helped to formulate and implement a strategy to neutralize the Iraqi state and military permanently. This is because uh, the Iranian regime's big lesson concerning Iraq uh, stems from the Iran-Iraq war where they, they, uh, the takeaway for, for them was uh, number one, that the Iraqi military poses an existential threat and probably the greatest existential threat to the Islamic Republic in, anywhere in the region. And secondly, that the fighting, having, having sent hundreds of thousands of young Iranians to their deaths uselessly in that war, the Iranian regime, Qasem Soleimani, decided to, to have a different way of war where they would fight through Arab proxies or Afghan proxies rather than uh, expend uh, Iranian blood. But the United States has never accounted for this. We didn't acknowledge and respond to this uh, strategy from the Iranian regime, which is still being implemented. We haven't done that today. Instead, for example, we let the ISIS campaign, which was necessary, uh, steer us into a misguided assumption that the IRGC and even Bashar al-Assad and Russia could be partners with the US in a counterterrorism uh, campaign. And that's still on some people's minds today. It, it, it's uh, it's absolutely a detachment of a military approach from a, from a proper political or geopolitical approach. There are many military lessons for the United States, which I won't belabor here, you know, having spent half a million words on, on them uh, already. But I would say, the, but the one that I think applies uh, today that I would highlight, in addition to the strategic ones I've just mentioned, is that a security assistance uh, effort is a political um, is a political initiative. We, as the United States, almost never uh, understand that, and we don't account in our security assistance, our massive security assistance efforts. For example, not just in Iraq, but in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Those are the two biggest. We never properly account for the political nature uh, of what we're doing in building security institutions the political pressures that those institutions are going to come under, the fact that the security institutions that we're building instantly become a major political prize to be fought over and killed over in, in these places. So we, we, we tend to, we, we don't account for that. We, we treat it as just a technical level and it, or a technical matter. And if it's not a political matter for us, we can be guaranteed that it'll be a political matter for somebody else, most often our enemies. A few, uh, a few positives uh, very quickly. As I said, I wouldn't wish Saddam back on the Iraqis. I think they're much better off. I have no doubt he would have killed a lot more Iraqis in the intervening period. Uh, I th the the uh, removal of the Saddam regime did unlock Iraq's massive potential. It's a big country, big growing population, potentially um, enormous e economy, great human capital, a lot of natural resources going for it. There's a huge opportunity there, not yet seized by the kleptocratic political class, which is under the influence of the Iranian regime and has been under the influence of the Syrian regime, et cetera, um, before. But I think the younger generation now in Iraq, and remember, Iraq is close to having a majority of its population with not just no living memory of Saddam, but no living memory of the war that came after Saddam. And that's so they're sort of un, unburdened. They're not weighed down by by that political baggage and social baggage. And I think I'm I, looking how how they behave and the way they're brave enough to go out on the street and the things that they want in life. I, I actually I think in the long term Iraq is going to be great and has and has the potential, especially when they outlive the Iranian regime, the Khamenei regime, and 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 so on. In that sense, I think the removal of Qasem Soleimani was a big positive for Iraq's future. Um, the Iranian regime can't replicate the kind of influence and destabilizing role that he played in Iraq. And, and, and that continued. It's almost like Iranian destabilizing influence now is on a decay, decaying of half-lives. And, uh, and over time, I think they'll get past the Qasem Soleimani role and Abu Mehdi al-Mohandis as well. As I mentioned, there are many, many uh, military operational and tactical positive lessons. I would have to say, though, that the U.S. military has largely not captured them in doctrine. So I think, unfortunately, sometime in the future, they'll just have to be dusted off the way that 
uh, Captain David Petraeus had to dust off the lessons that were drawn from the Vietnam War back in the 1980s and then implement them as a general in the, uh, in the 2000s. Thank you, Colonel Raven. You know, as, you, as, as we're talking here, you know, uh, Thomas Hobbes wrote the Viathan in 1651 um, uh, as the English Civil War was winding down. And his message was, you know, there's only one thing worse than the despot, it's anarchy. And um, Razak, you know, you uh, not only lived in Iraq, but you also worked in Libya. And, you know, this is a bipartisan tendency in the United States. We knocked over Saddam and anarchy kind of followed. And then we, we knocked over uh, Gaddafi and Libya followed. Um, so what do you, uh, as somebody who's sort of seen both of those things happen, what's your view? You're on mute. I think in my opinion, what happened, it's inevitable. I think for decades of dictatorship, like in Iraq and Libya or even in Syria, although the Syrian regime is different, um, Bashar Assad is still there. I think the collapse of the regimes would cause huge vacuum. Iraq is a very complicated country, um, you know, as I said. It's um, uh, multi sectarian, multi religious, multiple. And the number of, uh, of the victims of the, of the atrocity are, are massive. We still don't know exactly how many people were killed in the Intifada in 1991 and the mass graves and the others. And also the number of, of perpetrators, it's so high too. There's many people who work with Saddam. Saddam has huge number of apparatus, especially the inner circle, like the special uh, revolutionary guards and the Fidayeen and also the, the closet baths. And I, I always think I said, all right, so the US invaded Iraq and troubled Saddam and they were happening in Iraq, let us say, Hypothetically, all right, we blame the US, that's fine. But when I work in Libya, there is no, there is no single foreign boot in Libya soil. Libya was not invaded by, by, by any foreign, uh, uh, by any foreign uh, uh, armies, although the NATO helped with bombing. But what happened in Libya, I, I think now Libya is worse off than Iraq. And Libya is only, we, we talk about four, 4 million population. And by the way, they don't have Sunni Shia. Libya, the majority are, if it's not all, are Sunni. So even there is no sectarian conflict there. So maybe the, the, there is similarity between Iraq and Syria because it's all, as I say, it's a fake modern state, which is, you know, we have Sunni, you have Shia, you have Arab, you have Kurds, you have, you have uh, Christians and then the, um, yeah, and the other. So I think what happened in Syria, what happened in Iraq, and what happened in, 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 in Libya was, you know, in Vietnam. I always think, how about if we, the Iraqis, I was to Saddam without any help? What's, we, what's the outcome? I mean, wh what are we going to do with the, with the army? What, what are you going to do with the... With, it's, it's happened in 1991. And, uh, and Saddam, you, you know, even Saddam used, you used chemical weapons, or he almost used chemical weapons, but he used some powder in the, in the, in the north and in the south and to tell people this is a chemical weapon, and then uh, and everyone fled. And then he used very heavy, heavy machine and rockets to, to crush the, uh, the, the uprising. Mm -hmm. I think, in my opinion, with, without, without the U.S. military in 2003, that's my there was no force on earth that could go and get rid of Saddam and remove him from his palace. And if that's not okay. happen, we will have Saddam dynasty for generations. Yeah, and Uday and Kuse might have been worse. So this yeah. is a question that I think uh, is an anonymous question, but it's also a question that I, I, I've been thinking about a lot about recently, which is the lack of sort of self um, reflection in the United States on the fact that we launched this war in 2003 with basically one ally, the British, uh, with very, you know, it was not a NATO Article 5 or UN sort of sanctioned. And so when it comes to talk, you know, it's very difficult for the United States to talk about crimes of aggression as a charge against Putin, which is the easiest charge to prove in Ukraine, when the United States itself is sort of 
obviously a very different kind of war, but nonetheless, uh, there's some commonalities here. Uh, in Iraq, Simona, is there any kind of discussion of this issue? You mean the crimes committed by the Americans? Well, just the the, 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 the the parallel the with the with the Russia invasion. Yeah, the fact that the United States has sort of like done something not dissimilar, which right. sort of set some of the frame here. Right. I mean, so I think this is. I mean, this is a, a good and important question because I think in general Iraqis don't see the U.S. as um, how would I say. A force of for good. They see it as a country that is uh, that implements double standards, that acts based on its own interests, and the whole rhetoric around human rights and spreading democracy is just a pretext to further its own interests. And I think I think that view has been around for a really long time. So I think the way you know people see what is going on in Ukraine through very through a very different lens because they themselves, you know have been invaded and and for them it's like well i mean this is the same thing that america did uh it did in iraq in a way and and yes uh, yes it's it's wrong but they um they find it they do find it very strange that america is condemning russia's invasion and completely ignoring the fact that they they did the same thing in the past but i think i think there's just a general um you know kind of uh how would I say disillusionment uh, with with the U.S. I don't think Iraq is really. Some of them still have an expectation, like when, back when the Tishreen protests were taking place. Um, and of course, this was you know a very young crowd. It was you know uh, very idealistic to some extent. They would call for um, you know U.S. intervention to help to get rid of this this ruling elite. But I would say that that was a very kind of small uh, you know subsector of the population and overall there is just a very a general distrust and people look at the united states as as you know definitely not a reliable partner uh not a country that or uh, governments that can be trusted in its interests and and yeah i mean i think that's that's perhaps the legacy of of the u.s invasion here that you know there is just a, a complete uh, you know disillusionment and and mistrust joe i believe that's a a portrait of Fuad Ajami behind you. Yeah, who wrote a book called The Foreigner's Gift, um, yeah. making kind of a counter argument. Uh, there's a specific question directed to you, uh, sort of related to that and based on something you said. People made consensus decisions they felt correct, but you also highlighted that Iraq was a black box. Are these smart decisions if they're not really based on good information? Well, no, I, I, I didn't say they were smart decisions. I okay. said they were they were bad decisions I made by smart people. Right. So I'm not saying uh, the I mean that that that's what's that's what should be daunting is that smart, experienced, worldly people can make bad decisions, yeah. and uh, and and then have to deal with the with the consequences. Can we dig, 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 dig further into that? Because it seems that, you know, one of the kind of, Machiavelli said famously, uh, wars begin when when you will, but they don't end when you please. And so I think yeah. if there's an American tendency, like we're going to go in, it's going to be quick, it's decisive, and often it is. And then there's this, here we are 20 years later. So can you reflect a little bit on that? Well, I think, look, the, the, uh, the military operation to destroy Saddam's regime uh, was an astonishing success. Uh, what, what was an astonishing failure was the, the management of the aftermath. And then, yeah. the, and then the decisions that happened almost on autopilot to, uh, to the, then purposely collapse some of the Iraqi state institutions in the aftermath of the collapse of the regime. The biggest one is, of course, the dissolution of the Iraqi army, uh, which, and, and you know, then we had to reconstitute largely the same army over the next five years, uh, just with sort of 
Shia Baptist officers instead of Tikriti Baptist officers in the at the top of the of the general staff. So it it probably would have been better. Just I I'm 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 confident it would have been better just to keep the Iraqi army intact and then try to reform it. Uh, and at at a minimum you would have had what became the cadre of the insurgency, Sunni insurgency and the Shia insurgency, at least garrisoned where you could watch them. So, um, but that wasn't done. They were all, all these, you know, hundreds of thousands of armed men were sent out into the cold, not even with pensions. So it was, that was a spectacular blunder. But again, it was made by smart, experienced people who thought it was the best thing to do at the time, not just for Iraq, but for the region. There was, the, I, there was the idea that the Iraqi military institutions were a, a leading threat to the rest of the region. Well, they certainly were under Saddam's guidance, I think, but they also, they had an independent national character that was, that was dramatically underestimated. I don't think, something, uh, something Simona said, I think the disillusionment uh, that Iraqis feel concerning the United States, I don't think is because of the removal of Saddam. I think it's because you know, there's all this assumption. I used to hear it in in Iraq, in Baghdad, and elsewhere. You know, you're in the United States. You put a man on the moon, but you can't get the electrical grid running. So there were things like that. It, it was more. It, it it wasn't a disillusionment because of what we did. It was more a disillusionment of what we obviously weren't willing to do. And when when it when there was a, an assumption, we had the capability of of, of doing certain things. So it was always, you know, the question isn't why did you, why did you guys uh, invade? The question was, why aren't you guys doing anything about this? Can't you see these? Can't you see these Iranian people? Can't you see this uh, this problem? Why aren't you doing anything? Aren't you the United States? Well, to hell. Well, if you're not going to do anything, then to hell with you. Okay, and what's the answer to that, Joel? Look, I think part of it is that there was an overlearning of uh, there was there was came, the United States became way too gun shy of acting um, as a result of the 2003 war. And it's because of the, the, the overlearning of the idea that uh, George W. Bush decided to remove the Saddam regime and then everything exploded like a nuclear explosion across the Middle East. Well, I'm sorry, that, that's not the proper lesson to, to learn. You still have your national interest. You still have strategic objectives that you have to try to uh, align your, your means with. And that was that wasn't done. It has been done even to today. So so I think, for example, um, would we really say looking back on it, uh, Bashar al-Assad has has wound up killing hundreds of thousands of Syrians. And the reason there wasn't a, a more robust intervention to stop him from doing that, and I don't even mean to, I don't even mean to remove him, but just to stop him from doing that and try to stabilize the situation in Syria was because of of deep anxiety that the slightest move in that direction would result in a repeat of the, uh, of the consequences uh, of 2003. And so that, that's, a, that's another reason why we don't, we, you know, we're, we're now, um, we don't exert our power when, when we should these days. I, I think it's, it's kind of being unlearned. If you finally, I think, you know, we're getting past that a little bit with the Ukraine situation or, or a lot with the Ukraine situation, but, it's there's been a hell of a lot of mistakes in the intervening 20 years between, uh, you know, the fall of Baghdad and and the shoring up of Ukraine against the Russian invasion. OK, so a question for both Simona and, and Razak, which is, you know, one of the big changes post 9-11 seems to be the spread of sectarianism throughout the region. Obviously, it existed before, but it's become much amplified. Um, to what extent, what do you think is the Iraq war um, uh, the trigger for that? Um, so I just want to quickly, before I answer, say something about uh, what, what Joel mentioned. I mean, so first of all, the fact that, you know, that Iraq was a black box for the United States, I think it still is to a large extent. I think the United States still does not understand Iraq. And I think this is this is partly driven just by the nature of their presence here, that they are confined to this embassy compound in the green zone. Uh, so it's partly the physical restriction, and it's also an ideological decision to not engage with a significant part of Shia politicians because they're seen as being aligned with Iran. And I think that significantly limits 
the, the perspective uh, that you can get and it leads to a very just distorted view of Iraq that is primarily through an Iran lens. Everything in Iraq is seen through an Iran lens. And I think it leads to certain fallacies. And one of these fallacies is that, uh, for example, it's the, you know, and, and Joel mentioned something along the lines as well, that it's a kleptocracy that is under Iranian influence or control. And that is simply not true. Like, you know, corruption is the modus operandi for all politicians in Iraq, be it Kurds, uh, be it Sunnis, some of the most corrupt politicians today in Iraq are Sunni and they're not aligned with Iran. So, you know, it's, it's something that has, you know, led to this distorted understanding of Iraq because everything is seen through Iran's influence. And I gave the example of drugs earlier that, you know, it's generally seen as, okay, this is a financing mechanism for Iran aligned groups, which is also just a very small, uh, small part of, uh, of the picture. And, um, and in a way, you know, the disillusionment of the US is also because some people don't understand, for example, the previous government of Mustafa al Qadami, which a lot of Iraqis see as failures. They don't understand why the US supported that government. Um, so it's, it's not just disillusionment with, okay, you know, why didn't you, you know, uh, you know, help rebuild the country, help, you know, rebuild institutions. It's also about political choices that the US continues to make until today, which some Iraqis feel that they just don't understand. Uh, understand it um just to get to, to get to your you know question about sectarianism i mean i would really defer to abdul razak because this was actually a period where i was not in iraq uh that i think he would probably have a, a much better perspective i mean the only thing that i would say right now is that it has really receded a lot that uh it's not you know it's not the primary you know way in which people identify, in which we should look at political problems. There is, there is a lot of other fault lines that I think are more important than, than the sectarian lens. So while, yes, we saw the surge of sectarian identities and a lot, a lot, of, uh, a lot of bloodshed, I think you know, that period has uh, largely passed. It doesn't mean that it's there, but I, I don't think that it's, it's the most uh, kind of important issue uh, today. Is that? Yeah, I think. I remember in 2003, when I worked for New York Times, when interview people in Iraq, and when we asked them, are you Sunni and Shia, they get offended. They said, no, we, there's no different. I don't want to answer this question. I'm a Muslim. I said, okay. And then they said, you are the Western media try to divide it us all around. So even they accused me because I work for New York Times in Iraq. Later on, it was a brutal sectarian conflict and the civil war in Iraq. Even there was ethnic cleansing. So the, 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 the divisions, as I said before, is not among the political parties. In fact, the political parties, they were Sunni and Shia, they were getting along. Because if you look at them, they are Islamic parties, both Sunni and Shia, and they have the same agenda. I mean, Dawah party and the um, Muslim Brotherhood are, are the same. It's just like Dawah is the, is the Shia version of, of Muslim Brotherhood. So the invasion definitely revived the division of the Sunni and Shia. We had the sectarian for centuries, but not among the society. Uh, I know Iraq since 1921, it's ruled by, by, by the Sunni minorities. But it's, it's the society, it, yeah, it, you know, it was okay. So it was not like as common before. But also the invasion, I think, is reshaped the conflict in the whole Middle East. When I grew up in my generation, in the, when I was in the 80s or the 90s, if you ask anyone, what was the major conflict in the Middle East? Everyone will say the Arab, the Arab Israeli war. If you ask them after 2003, if I ask you everyone, what's the major conflict now in the Middle East? It's Saudi Iran. It's the in, in fact, the Arabs now align with the with, with, with the Israelis, <laughs> you know, against Iran. So it's the it's a Sunni Shia. It's the Iran influence among you know in in, in Shia countries, and it, you know that's the axis. And the other one is the Arab Sunni axis. So yes, the invasion it's 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 amplified this you know, this division, and even even this even this in the in the society. I, I'll give you one example. Um, in the um, 
and the Saddam tri Tribunal, which is I mo monitored all the all the Saddam trial. So when I look at the judges and the prosecutor, they all Shia and Kurd, except one prosecutor is Sunni. And guess what? All the defendants are Sunni. So in the society is like now it's a Shia prosecute Sunni. Yeah, so that is so therefore Saddam later on become you know popular among not just among the Iraqi Sunni, but also among all the uh, Arab Sunni groups. Yeah. Joe. I yeah, I don't I uh I don't agree with Simona. I don't think Iraq is a black box to Americans now. Um I didn't just parachute into the situation in 2018. I mean, I think I think here in Washington we have a pretty good understanding of the Shia Islamist parties and the Hashid, for example. We have a long history with those people. Um, I don't think we're missing some opportunity to sort of rehabilitate Kaisal Ghazali, for example, or Hadi Al Amri. So I think in it, actually the mistake of the last several years has been to assume that there's some sort of trade space where they could be weaned off of IRGC influence. And I so look, if if Iraq were just a corruption problem, um, the United States would not have much of a strategic interest in addressing that. It is the influence, it is the fact that the Iranian regime can parasitically uh, suck from the Iraqi economy, that they have uh, the level of influence in Iraqi politics that they do, that they can divert state resources, for example, to the tune of $2 billion into the Hashid. Corruption is, is a spectacular problem. It's the problem that the younger generation of Iraqis is, is, uh, is contending with. As a geopolitical matter, the number one issue in Iraq for the United States is the IRGC Quds Force and its influence and its ability to use Iraqis as proxies and Iraq as a strategic outpost for the IRGC to threaten the rest of the region and US allies and interests in a way that has never been seen before in the modern era coming coming out of Iran. So I don't think there's a, I, I don't think that's mistaken. Simona. I'm not sure what Joel means by parachuting into Iraq in 2018. I've actually lived in the country for five years um, and I speak Arabic. So I think I do know what's going on on the ground. Um, but um, but no, I mean, I think there is a, a tendency to I, I think there's a very simplistic way of looking at these so-called um, Iran-aligned actors. I think looking at them as Iranian proxies denies them their own history uh, because they rose up, first of all, against Saddam and then against the American invasion and occupation. And yes, they were supported and funded by Iran, but by calling them Iranian proxies, we deny them their uh, objective to actually resist an occupation. And I think that's a very important part of their history that, that tends to be omitted. And I think the way you can best describe them today, and I interact with these actors on a regular basis, is that they're at a strategic level, their interests are aligned with Iran on a lot of things, but not on all things, but they very much have their domestic, political, economic, and social interests. And of course, it's a very difficult question of, of, of how to deal with them. Um, some people, they, they say that uh, it requires time and stability uh, to gradually absorb them into the political process, that this is the only way forward because they are here to stay. They are not leaving. And we have seen some of that transition uh, take place. Uh, and of course, others, they, they you know, propose a, a much harsher approach and I think it is a very difficult question, but I don't think there is a, a simple answer, you know, such as these are Iranian proxies and they need to be uh, basically eliminated because they're not going anywhere. They're uh, like it or not, Kaisal Khazari is uh, an uh, important player in, in the Iraqi political scene. And of course, uh, the current government is, is very much backed by, by this alliance. So this is the reality on the ground. And that's what, you, what any US administration needs to work with. Uh, Abdul Razak, um, you have the final word as the, uh, as the uh, Iraqi in the room.
in general or about a specific question? Whatever you want to say. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's really, it's really complicated. And there is no, there is no easy answer because for, for all the questions, what the hypothesis, if that happened of that way, it wouldn't happen. Uh, who should be blamed and what's the legacy? I think we we are the yeah the, the legacy of of of, uh, of of atrocity. I think the 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 U.S. had an excellent plan to get rid of Saddam. They sex they, they were successful to get rid of Saddam within only three weeks, which is that something no one no one thought about it. But I think the problem is the post-war plan was very very poorly planned. So we paid, we paid a lot. And again, we might gain our freedom, but we lost our national identity. And why I say that, because I see all the people who fighting and kill each other, they were having the Iraqi flag and they think they are real Iraqis. So therefore, when I said, who's the real Iraqis now? So, but I hope, as Simona said, I hope, in future now with a new generation after to trade. And I think this generation, they got the problem. And there was main, there were main slogan and chanting. They said, Nuridi Wata mean we need a country. We need to get back country back. So I think that might give us hope for a better future. Okay, well, thank you very much, Simona, for, for staying up uh, in Baghdad. And thank you very much, Abdul Razak. And thank you very much, Colonel Rabin. I guess is uh, we didn't really resolve uh, some outstanding questions completely. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much for bringing some real expertise to them. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you. Thanks for having us.